Good evening and welcome to everyone this evening. Um, our talk tonight is a part of a series of uh, communications from Surrey Wildlife Trust that's been designed to complement the current discussions that are taking place in Glasgow um, for COP26 at the moment. And we all know there's been a, a worldwide buzz around this, and I'm sure you agree, it seems like the eyes of uh, the whole world are on our small island at the moment, waiting and hoping, as we all are, for positive outcomes uh, and, and some commitment. Um, and we believe it's really essential that any promises and action is, is indeed carried out because urgent action is really needed to keep us below um, a proposed target of 1.5 degrees C. Now we know that probably is not likely and with a lot of the talks at the moment. Um, so, you know, regardless of this, we know we have to adapt. Wildlife will have to adapt to these changes. And many of you yourselves would have experienced um, the impact of these changes, such as increase in flooding instances, especially in Surrey, um, and of course, serious wildfire, serious wildfires, um, and including those on our lowland heathland um, reserves. Of course, we've got um, our national nature reserves, our heathland nature reserves uh, that we're privileged to have in Surrey. But climate is affecting these things, and wildlife is already under immense pressure. And a few years ago, we released our State of Surrey's Nature Report, which highlighted that we have lost and are losing uh, around a third of species in this county. Now, wildlife not only has to contend with fragmentation and pressures of land, but obviously it also has current pressures from, from climate as well. But it's not all doom and gloom. And we know that if we work to repair and restore wildlife habitats, you know, these ecosystems can help to absorb and mitigate these impacts of climate change, which is so, so important. Um, we have the solutions on our doorstep and the myriad of habitats that we have, chalk uh, grasslands, lowland heathlands, hedgerows, woodlands can help to, to store and absorb this carbon that's needed. And we know that biodiversity and climate are, in, are uh, instructively linked and uh, by implementing what we call nature-based solutions, we can address uh, the impact of climate change. To do this, we need to work together and we're working across the county with other landowners and organisations to do so. We cannot do this on our own and we are collaborating with others uh, to achieve our vision. We do believe everyone can play their part and everyone here included, and we hope that we can all work together to help achieve a wilder and a greener future for Surrey. So I will now pass over uh, and introduce our fabulous guest speaker for this evening. Sophie Baval is a zoologist and science communicator uh, who is currently writing her first book, which we're very excited about. Uh, Sophie uh, is the communications coordinator for the Beaver Trust, an ambassador for the Wildlife Trust and also sits on the RSPB England Committee. Uh, we've had some fantastic connections with Sophie and she's also participated in doing fantastic youth work with us at Surrey Wildlife Trust. So I will now pass over to Sophie and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Amy, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for choosing to spend your Thursday evening with, with me. Uh, I'm very flattered. I know that Zoom talks are slightly, you know, 2020, but um, no, it's exciting to have you here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and see if you can see that. Please shout at me if there's any problems, because <laughs> once I get going, there's no stopping. So uh, the talk this evening is um, quite special because it's the first talk I'm giving about my book and I feel very uh, unready <laughs> to do this. Um, but, you know, you need to start somewhere and it's very apt, I guess, to be talking about this during all the noise and frenzy around COP26. So hopefully there'll be a couple of takeaway points um, here that might resonate with you in, in one way or another. Um, and it's it's very special to be doing a talk on Remembrance Day as well. So um, just to follow on from what Amy said, really, um, I'm a zoologist and science communicator. Uh, I studied zoology at Bristol a few years ago and then followed on with a master's in science communication. And that really opened my eyes into the, the world of 
communicating science to the public and basically acting as like a middleman between the research and the public and trying to convey all these important messages. And I don't think at the time that I was studying, I realized quite how needed science communicators are, especially at the moment, as we're seeing with COP26, you know, we need people to be breaking down these very complicated topics and telling us what to do and what not to do and what's important and, you know, highlighting the truths and perhaps the, the fake news and all of that. So it's a really exciting time to be in this industry. Um, and early on in, in my work, I became affiliated with the Lovely Wildlife Trust and they've been so supportive for all my work and I've had some amazing opportunities with them. So it's always really great to be coming back and, and doing stuff with them. Um, so do all sorts of stuff. I work with Beaver Trust. Um, most recently, I worked for them a few days a week. And last year, we released a documentary about beavers called Beavers Without Borders, which um, has has been an amazing experience. And obviously, beaver news is very hot right now. Um, I actually did a, another talk to Surrey Wildlife Trust a few weeks ago about beavers. So you can go on their YouTube and watch that if you're curious about them. But today, it's all about butterflies. And, um, and it's quite nice as a sort of delve back into summer, I guess, <laughs> on this very dark evening. Um, so how it's going to work, I'll probably talk for, I haven't timed it, but uh, I think it'll probably be about half an hour uh, max. And then there'll be time for some questions if you have any. Um, so yeah, so this, uh, uh, I do a lot of writing on the side for magazines and a couple papers and things. And I really love the way that you can reach new audiences with, with words. And I didn't really realize that. Um, you know, until fairly recently when I was asked to write a book and it's just been the most crazy, amazing experience. And, um, you know, I, I think crucially, I'm not a naturalist. And Amy and I were talking about this with Ben before you all came on. Um, I think rather I'm a, I'm a concerned, excited enthusiast <laughs> who's keen to tell more people about the natural world and just to sort of show how fun it is, but how important it is to restore that connection with nature um, and the sort of trials and tribulations and, and successes and failures with, with going to find animals is all a good laugh and important. Um, so a little bit about the book. These photos are photos that have been taken or that I took. I did all the travel pretty much on my own um, in the middle of a pandemic, quite challenging, probably would not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely not the plan. It was, it was, it was not meant to be that way, obviously. Um, so, so these were all taken in the last 18 months. I traveled from top to bottom of Britain, pretty much from Bodmin all the way up to North Ronaldsay at the top of Orkney, trying to find 10 species, uh, which are very kind of overlooked and unknown and may or may not be severely threatened by climate change in one way or another. All the travel for this was low carbon, so bike, train, buses, walking, paddleboarding, kayak, everything, ferries, cargo ships, all these sorts of things um, to try and investigate, you know, how realistic is it for society to sort of transform our infrastructure into a low carbon one? Uh, is it realistic? Is it feasible? Um, that sort of thing. So it was it was a really, really, it was a real adventure. Um, and there are many elements to, to the stories as well as just finding out more about the species. Um, and I meet expert contributors along the way as well. And so their stories and their research and their commentaries um, really weave into the whole narrative of each chapter. And they really, I think, brought each story to life, which, um, I'm so grateful for. Uh, so I can't give too much away with regards to the different species in the book. Uh, we're exploring one today, um, but it, it's it's uh, yeah it's early days. The book's out next June, so we've got plenty of time. But yeah, I loved every single second of it. And um, this talk focuses on chapter one, which is about the marsh fritillary. <clears throat> so a bit of context behind it all, in case you haven't heard. <laughs> Uh, we're in a bit of a climate crisis, we're in a bit of a sticky situation. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. It's the most nature depleted country in Europe. One in seven species are at risk of total extinction. Um, and as we've seen during COP26, we're at a bit of an epic crossroads and all eyes are on us, as Amy said, we're on the global stage. And so everyone's kind of watching to see what the other one's doing. And it's all a bit confusing. And, scary and very anxiety inducing and um 
it's easy to feel overwhelmed and so I try and uh dispel that overwhelm with I don't know just kind of take it back to the simplicity of just getting outside getting in nature finding out what's around me and taking my own kind of climate action and I suppose I, I like to think uh, and I've been thinking about this a few for a few days that writing this book has been my climate action um, and I hope it might be able to be other people's in some way I don't know um, so with all this climate noise, um, it's not really a case of we still have time to reverse the changes. I think more it's a case of the faster we act, the less we lose. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so with all of this in mind, I mean, this was just such a huge motivator for, for writing is to try and figure out what, what is going on and how can we help and looking to the UK and looking at a, from a localized point of view and not trying to feel overwhelmed and looking at the world because that's just not feasible. So I headed to Bodmin Moor. Oh wait, here's, I forgot the order of my slides. Here's Marsh Fritillary. Isn't it gorgeous? It is one of the most beautiful butterflies in the world, I think. Um, and we're gonna be learning all about it and it's very exciting. It's very, very weird and wonderful. Um, let's go back to, oh, sorry. Oh no, here we go. Marsh Fritillary 101. The Marsh Fritillary is a very special one because it's kind of through no fault of its own become a complete global symbol of conservation success which is quite nice. I think it's all, it's very tempting with the lead and I've given, I guess, to assume it's gonna be complete doom and gloom. But no, this is a conservation sort of success story. And um, it's truly bouncing back in its own way. So we have a family of fritillaries in, in the UK and they're colloquially called the checker spots, which I think is just delightful. Um, and as you can see on their underwing here, it's this kind of amazing ornate tessellation which gives fritillaries their name and um, I think we've got eight in Britain, don't quote me on that, and the marsh fritillary is known as the most audacious of all the fritillaries because it's just so kind of loud and colourful and beautiful. Um, as you can see, <laughs> it has a lot of paperwork attached to it. I think messing with the marsh fritillary will give you a bit of a legal headache if you decide to go and uh, uh, try and sort of mess with its population because they're incredibly protected. They're one of the most highly protected species in the world uh, for butterflies. And, you know, it's it's great that they've got this protection, but also it's a slight red flag um, that they are just, you know, in dire straits and in desperate need of all the assistance and the paperwork and the admin that they can get. So they're very vulnerable. They're of principal importance. They have a larval food plant, which we'll get into in a bit, called Devil's Bit Scabious, which is quite a cool name. Botany has done very well in stealing all the good names. Um, its life cycle takes about a year to, to circle around. Its preferred habitat is unimproved grassland, tussock grassland, and chalk grassland. It is. Um, it has very specific <laughs> habitat requirements, which is partly um, a cause for concern, as we will also find out. Um, and yes, it's declined by nearly 80% everywhere. And so, yeah, it's not, it's not doing brilliantly. Um, just thought you might be interested uh, in looking at the last recorded marsh fritillary in Surrey. So this was from Butterfly Conservation. And we can see that the marsh fritillary was last recorded or the last official uh, sighting was in the 1970s. And interestingly, you can see how dominant the fritillaries are in these last records, which is quite sad. Um, and, and this is presumably because they just have such specific habitat requirements. And especially in the south of England, which is very friendly to butterflies, we've had an awful lot of land use change. Um, so yes, that's quite interesting. So why did the marsh fritillary disappear? Well, there are lots of different uh, answers to that. Um, as a species, the marsh fritillary has this, what's called a boom and bust population cycle. It's a very volatile and very volatile way of living where it kind of blinks in and out of extinction all the time. And that's normal. It sounds really stressful, but it just that's just the way it is. Um, and post-war, 
uh, back in sort of 1950s and 60s, there was this incredible surge in demand for uh, prime agricultural land and intense productivity um, to feed the nation after the war. And that was just the absolute priority at the time. And it's just a classic case of when those decisions were made, nature and nature's long-term health were just not even considered. And they were just on the back burner and kind of we'll deal with it later. And here we are later really dealing with it. Um, and so all of its favorite habitats of unimproved grassland and chalk grassland and this kind of swathes of lovely upland ecosystem were just cleared and drained for farming and grazing and livestock and everything. And um, that really was the agricultural revolution. Um, and a, a 2006 study by X University predicted that the marsh fertility would go extinct by 2020 if nothing changed and conditions stayed the same. Now, I did all this research and the trip in 2020, and uh, I can confirm that the species is not extinct, but it is very much hanging by a thread and conditions uh, in terms of our, the way that we view the land are changing, but perhaps not fast enough. So as a whole, the marsh fertility has declined by 75% in just 25 years, and colonies are lost from 80% of the spaces where they once thrived. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a sad story, but there is hope. And just want to really hammer home how beautiful this butterfly is. The underwing is, the, the under, if you want to tell a fritillary is a fritillary, you look at the underwing, that is, it's like fingerprint sort of thing. And the marsh fritillary is just the most beautiful like apricot sort of stained glass window. It's just very pretty. So as with all butterflies and moths and most insects, unfortunately, agriculture and farming is largely uh, a huge driver of their decline. And the State of Nature, is, the State of Nature report, excuse me, in 2019, so the most recent report looking at the state of nature, a big thermometer into how nature's really doing, found that Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths, are the hardest hit of any species um, in Britain which is quite striking. And in Southwest England, agricultural turnover is 2.7 billion, which is the highest, the highest turnover of any region in the UK. So that's kind of mainly Devon and Cornwall. Um, and that's where the marsh fertility, you know, the remaining colonies, that's where they persist. So that's really huge, the fact that their habitat is so dominated by productive agriculture. And to make way for this agricultural land, regional culm grassland so it's lovely this lovely tussocky i think they're known as, well down here on dartmoor they're known as baby heads they're like <laughs> it sounds really cruel they're like sort of big humps of grass and like the lovely kind of coarse long grassland sticking up so that is sort of culm grassland 92 percent of that has been lost and culm grassland i'm just looking at my notes here is so special it stores five times more water than monoculture grassland and the topsoil beneath the tussocks stores twice as much carbon as, as the surrounding land. So around, in this case, around intensively managed areas. So that's a huge resource that has been lost. Um, and it's just kind of the same old story where we're, we're losing things before we really know how valuable they are. And so it's a, a bit like peat, peatland and peat bogs, you know, it's a it's a case where we seriously need to just spend time finding out more about what the land actually does for us before we just kind of push it to one side. Um, and it's a well quoted statistic that nearly 80% of the whole of the UK is farmland. And obviously this is quite carbon intensive and is contributing to greenhouse gases and everything. Um, you know, drainage, reseeding, replanting, plowing, fertilizers, the lot it's not great for butterflies, which are quite delicate, sensitive um, animals. And in Devon and Cornwall, only 8% of marsh fertility favorite habitat is squeezed into these popular counties. So there's a lot of statistics in there, but we'll unpack that in a minute. Let's move on. So, oh, this is a slide I was trying to find earlier when I was whizzing through. Um, <laughs> I thought I skipped a vital connection of location. So. With all of this in mind, I decided to uh, head to Bodmin Moor and feel very lucky that such a rare species was kind of right on my doorstep. Um, so I decided to go see if I could find it. 
And I was told that um, a place called Hellman Tor, just off the A30 um, on Bodmin Moor was a, was a very good, almost guaranteed spot for them. And I was going in late June and this is when in their life cycle, uh, it's when their flight period is. So I was hoping to see the butterflies in flight. And so I went on the train, it was at an hour on the train and I took my bike with me and had, as you can see, a rather weather, uh, a bit of a weather roller coaster, I guess. Sunny day turned into the heaviest trains I've ever ridden in and um, a rather soggy Sophie on the way home. But it was so much fun. And um, Helm and Tor is amazing. If you're even faintly interested in botany or plants or nature, put Helm and Tor on your list. It's one of the 57 nature reserves managed by Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And it's absolutely amazing. It's just a complete patchwork of the weirdest habitats kind of all mushed together. Um, it's a geology site, it's got an ancient monument, it's a special area of conservation, it basically gave me every chance possible to try and see these butterflies. Um, however, devil's bit scabious, this lovely flower here, which is their favourite food, their larval food plant, essential to their survival, uh, was not in flower when I was there, um, it was a little bit late in the season, but safe to say, Breeny Common, Helm and Tor, I had very high hopes. <laughs> Um, and before I actually it was after I went on the trip, I learned a little bit more about its life cycle. And if you ask any butterfly expert or butterfly enthusiast about the marsh fritillary, they always absolutely rave about marsh fritillary's life cycle. It's just amazing. It's like the weirdest kind of, I mean, butterflies have an incredible life cycle anyway, but the marsh fritillary is just like on a different level. It's in a different league. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and so the, one of the main things that I can't believe is that they lay up to, so this tiny, this is a male and a female here mating. Lovely. Um, very pretty. Look, here's the upper wing. Bit darker, but still so beautiful. Um, the, the female marsh artillery has an egg burden of up to 350 eggs. And here they are here. They don't look real, do they? They look like those little hammer beads or BB gun pellets or something. Um, and she carries them all to a leaf of devil's bit scabious, which is here. And then she lays them. And so she, she's like a sort of cargo plane carrying all these eggs to lay them. And it takes, as I said earlier, a year for the marsh fritillary to, to sort of waltz through its life cycle. Um, and the larvae shed its coat five times. So it has six stages or six instars. Um, and these aren't in order, which is probably uh, a fault of mine, most definitely. But essentially the whole process is absolutely amazing. And in the book, I compare it to um, the stages of adolescence and growing up as a teenager, uh, because the whole process is governed by complete hormonal fluctuations. And so I had a lot of fun writing that chapter and really rinsing that metaphor <laughs> or analogy. Um, and so all the caterpillars, hundreds and hundreds, commune together like this um, in Devil's Bit Scabious in these lovely rough grasslands. And they hibernate over winter, which is mad. So right now they're going to be getting ready to have, you know, hunker down in the winter while we're here and our heated hose and fires on and hot drinks these tiny little caterpillars are out in upland grassland getting ready to to um last through the winter which is um, incredible and they spin these silk webs which are like little hammocks and cocoons which help protect them from passing birds and just help sort of insulate them a little bit and then they hatch eventually they go solitary so they kind of break away from the party here and then they end up in this lovely chrysalis and then they hatch into the most beautiful butterfly and the whole thing is just amazing I mean look at that imagine having a dress or a top like that it's amazing um and so they're very easy to spot and and so I kind of wish I had seen some of these stages but I was against sort of time and COVID and everything else but hey ho uh, it's an incredible thing and I would definitely look it up if you can it's just mad um, so with such an incredible life cycle you can probably imagine that because it's so ornate and so detailed that evolution has worked really hard <laughs> to try and um, make it work and happen on time and temperature 
and advancing springs, hotter springs. I don't know if you remember the spring last year was particularly hot, very, very dry, especially in Surrey, I'm sure. Um, the, this is not good news for nature, let alone insects, especially seriously feel the heat. Insects are incredible indicators of healthy habitats and seasons behaving themselves. And as soon as the insects start to be affected by that, it's a serious alarm bell telling us that something is seriously wrong. Um, and the marsh fritillary in particular relies on seasonal consistency and good timing. And the life cycle that we just learned about, everything needs to happen on time for it to work. There's no other way to put it. And for people like me who rely on coloured lists and post notes and diaries and colour codes, and look at all these colours here, this is my pen pot. All of these colours have a meaning. So for me, <laughs> The idea that temperature and huge big elements and forces are disrupting this incredibly detailed process of the marsh fritillary coming to life is quite anxiety inducing. And so um, it's, it's a sudden loss of control and it feels quite weird. And this whole thing of, oh, this lovely weather and this sunny weather and, oh, February is really warm, isn't it lovely? This November is very mild, too mild. It's not really something to celebrate. Um, because climate change is suddenly becoming a huge pressure on these tiny little animals to come up with a plan B very fast. And evolution doesn't really work fast. It likes to have a few thousand million years to uh, come up with a plan. Uh, so butterflies are great indicators of habitat health. And interestingly, the year I went to see it last year, 2020, saw the early earliest average sightings for butterflies uh, for the past 20 years. And I don't know if you saw, but if you remember seeing butterflies loads and really early last year, um, but that wasn't necessarily a great thing because they're emerging earlier. And so um, other things are disrupted, such as little tiny parasites. This is a wasp, believe it or not. And this is a human hand and it's not mine. Um, but interestingly, about 80% of butterflies and moths are prone to attack by wasps. And um, this is something I want to talk to you about because it's a lot more complicated than uh, the temperature simply affecting and disrupting and being a bit annoying for the butterfly's life cycle. Because as with nature and the food web and the network that exists in a habitat among species, there's a domino effect. Once something happens to one species, it knocks onto another species, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you destabilize and that's when things start to happen quite quickly. So for a parasitic wasp, it's so interesting. So it's survival, excuse me. Uh, I just had dinner really quickly. So yeah, <laughs> uh, the parasitic wasp, its survival depends directly on the death of its host. So this wasp will invade one of those lovely juicy caterpillars that we saw earlier kill it or sort of slowly eat it, directly lay its eggs in there and basically use the carcass of the dead caterpillar as like a little refuge for its developing eggs and then it will uh, hatch and it will all be very happy and lovely. So this is called the Cotesia species of wasp and this directly plagues our marsh fritillary. Um, and roughly three generations of this wasp have produced per generation of marsh fritillary. So it's quite um, efficient and productive and as I say in the book, try not to see these guys as the bad guys. They are more, they're very natural and this is meant to happen. Try to see them maybe more as the neighborhood watch of the area where they're kind of supervising everything and keeping everything in check. Um, whilst of course, at the same time, ensuring the continuation of their own species, but it's a really interesting way of them structuring the ecology and maintaining a sustainable number of marsh fritillary in a habitat. And so I spoke with this amazing researcher who's probably the, the leading expert on marsh fritillary, and she's called Dr. Caroline Bullman from Butterfly Conservation. And she told me that parasitism is only a problem. So this dynamic between wasp and marsh fritillary is only a problem if the habitat is not good enough. And if the surrounding habitat is not connected, if it's too fragmented um, and there's not enough of a network uh, to support this complex dynamic. Um, actually, this parasitism is a completely vital part of the health of the marsh fritillary and the upland ecosystem. 
And unfortunately, there's actually a growing body of, in, of evidence to show that rising temperatures can disrupt and derail this crucial interaction between wasp and marsh fritillary and actually cause the marsh fritillary to emerge first and emerge too early. So we talked about those earlier springs, the marsh fritillary could emerge first and outrun the wasp because the wasp can't catch up with it in terms of the, what, what time it emerges. And so this could then cause a surge in, our, in numbers of the marsh fritillary. And if the habitat isn't good enough, they're gonna run out of food, there's gonna to be too many to, to be supported by the habitat and it could go extinct within a year. So I thought that was really striking and a really fascinating example of how climate change is not directly affecting the species as such, it's a very kind of coy, devious way of almost disrupting and destabilizing something even worse, which is a whole ecosystem ecological relationship. So what do we need to stop this happening? See all this lovely double split scabious here. This is a really lovely complex kind of tussocky, moist, lovely, calm grassland. So like Caroline told me, a large well-connected habitat will basically be like an insulation buffer against not only the dynamics of the parasite, so it will allow the parasite to not have too much of an effect in terms of denting marsh fritillary numbers, but if we have extremes of weather, drought, flooding, early springs, warm winters, um, it will just act as like a comfort blanket to help it basically not go extinct. Um, and ideally with marsh fritillary, you'd have lots of little colonies dotted throughout the whole landscape. Um, and this promotes high recovery rates. So if they, you know, have kind of used up a habitat and it's not great, but then they know there's a good one nearby, they'll just fly to the next one. So they need to have those opportunities available so that they continue to do that. But this, unfortunately, in this country is rarely the case. Um, so there's been, as I said earlier, with the agricultural revolution, a huge disconnect and fragmentation of the land. But remember, marsh fertility is used to these boom and bust population dynamics. They're used to blinking in and out of extinction all the time. Um, it's how they recolonize. And there's actually a dispersal gene in fertility DNA, which I think is crazy. So they're, they're born to move, um, but we've got to help them do that. But if it happens, it, if this blinking in, a, in and out of extinction over time happens in a habitat where there's nowhere to move on to, there's nowhere for them to recolonize, that's a real issue. And as I said earlier, extinction can literally happen in a year because there's no generation behind them to replace what's lost. And so we need these mosaic of habitats. Um, grazing pressure, as these sheep here, it's not a great photo, but... Um, <clears throat> Basically, sheep are the most aggressive of grazers. They just will just go pff, mow habitat down. And grazing is important to maintain variety, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> devil's bit scabious is one of sheep's favorite plants. And so if there's an environment where sheep are and devil's bit scabious is, and there isn't much other variety, they will just mow it down and our poor marsh fritillary will have not much to eat. And overgrazing can also uh, make a habitat really prone to drought and reduce that resilience to those climatic stresses, um, which are ever increasing. Well, what's the solution? So total abandonment um, is not an option. We can't just give an environment totally back to nature, despite, you know, it, it's not one of the rewilding narratives at all. Um, Caroline from Butterfly Conservation told me that actually it's a balance between light, very managed grazing, um, because that maintains a mixture of short and long lengths of grass and it promotes variety and it reduces invasive species of plants and promotes the native species like devil's foot scabious and that is that sort of complex um lightly grazed environment is ideal for our marsh fertility to um disperse among and to colonize and move about and do its thing because if it's left in total abandon that grass will grow too much and for our tiny marsh fertility which is like the width of its diameter two wings here the whole thing is this wide, roughly, um, it'll be like a jungle and it won't be able to move and lay its eggs and it'll be too dense and counterproductive. <clears throat> so there has been loads of study in areas like Dorset and the most effective um, method, I think, of managing habitat for marsh fertility was recently abandoned grazing. So, because um, uh, that had left a grassland that was between five and 20 centimetres, and they were found uh, to really increase and be great for marsh fritillaries. So 
um, in Dorset, populations in these areas were up by fivefold in areas of grassland that were recently abandoned um, because they've maintained that variation, but it's not kind of sort of so much that they just can't even fly through it. Um, remember, marsh fertility have this enormous egg burden when they're in their life cycle. So if you imagine a female trying to fly through a dense jungle of uh, vegetation with nearly 400 eggs, um, it might be really difficult for her to find something. Uh, on the same end of the, you know, on the other end of the scale, if there's barely any variation and it's mown down to a cricket pitch, um, she's going to really struggle and she'll tire out and she'll probably die. So height is key here for grassland. And this is what the research is finding that they really need. Um, so the recipe for success for this beautiful butterfly is actually really simple. And it is the same for basically any other species. Uh, so they need good quality habitat and they need large patches of good quality habitat. So it's that mosaic, that variety, the opportunity for them to colonize is absolutely key. It needs to be well connected. So they need to, you could have like an area of farmland and an area of kind of rough grassland or chalk grassland. And then if there's like a sort of scrubby corridor in between to allow them to move from one to the next, maybe have a rest, have a feed, then go on to the next. That's so much easier. Agri-environment schemes, we'll go into these in a second, but it's essential, obviously, that we include landowners and farmers in this conversation, because uh, if 80% of the UK is occupied by farmland and used for farmland, we're going to need to talk to some farmers and landowners if we want to help nature out, and they are the best people to help us do that. And again, if recolonization is impossible, remember these butterflies are born to move, they have this dispersal gene, local extinction is incredibly possible and likely and probably will happen if they can't recolonize and move from one area to the next to feed their sort of boom and bust volatile nature um then it's bad news indeed a uh, couple of projects um again shouting out butterfly conservation because they really have led the research here because there are just such isolated pockets of these guys left in the country um they did these two projects uh in bodmin and dartmoor and um, they were incredible at giving us insight into what we need to do <laughs> for this guy. So flight they found with, um, with this recipe, let's go back to this a sec. Oh, let's go back to that. Yes, with all of these things. So they did this on Dartmoor and Bodmin, okay? And agri-environment schemes and everything like this. They found flight paths. This is really key for successful dispersal and recolonization. They actually halved 260 meters. Larval food webs, so those are the webs that were built around those lovely sort of mass of, of caterpillars um, in the life cycle rose by 1,082%, which is huge. And now 71%, uh, 71, sorry, sites on Dartmoor are now actively managed for marsh fertility. And the way they did this is they basically just engaged people, <laughs> a very novel concept, um, uh, to, to basically train them up and educate them into how to manage the land and cultivate it in favour of this butterfly, but with no cost to their productivity. So this is where the agri-environment schemes come in. Um, and it was a really brilliant celebration of collaboration between conservationists, scientists and landowners. And I know the Wildlife Trust do fantastic work in facilitating these these sorts of projects and discussions as well. It's so, so important um, to show that balance between people and nature can be achieved if we just try and figure out the needs of these key indicators of healthy habitat and then realize actually what, what the marsh fritillary and other butterflies and other insects need is not that dissimilar to what we need in terms of food, shelter, good habitat nice place to grow your babies and lay your eggs and all these things. And obviously good habitat for the marsh fertility means good habitat for us, productive habitat for farmland, strong networks, resilience to climate change, all of these sorts of things. And this lovely quote was from um, Dr. Oh, she's not a doctor yet. She's a PhD researcher, but she might be a doctor very soon. Rachel Jones from the University of Exeter, who's doing a lot of research on marsh fertility populations. Um, and she just was telling me how easily we forget how everything is interlinked. And um, that doesn't mean the, just the marsh fertility and its habitat, but it's also the marsh fertility and the Cotesia wasp and the marsh fertility and the devil's bit scabious. 
martial artillery and people. It's all so, so related. Um, and she was saying how uh, vital it is to capitalize on the remaining populations of this butterfly um, and ensuring the habitat around it is as good as possible to boost that resilience and to make it a robust uh, place to absorb all the effects of climate change and agriculture and everything that, that is happening and going to happen in the coming years. And we need to just keep remembering how much of an indicator, yes, it's a beautiful species and would the world implode if the marsh artillery went extinct? No, of course it wouldn't. However, its vulnerability is a huge alarm bell, very loud alarm bell, um, telling us that something is desperately wrong. And so if we can fix these key indicator species and boost their populations, we're going to be helping so many other species that we probably don't even know about yet um, as a result, because again, it's that network. Um, and so, so yeah, that is a whistle-stop tour of the marsh artillery. And whether I saw it or not, well, maybe you'll have to have them read and find out whether I saw it. But um, that's probably a good time to, to stop waffling on um, and open up the floor to any questions you might have. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating talk and uh, really exciting to hear how the book is taken off and all of the research and adventures that have gone into developing this. And um, I think for me, a, a highlight is the, the impact of collaboration of people mm. and how we can make a difference and through the actions that we're doing and um, collaborating and working together through citizen science mm. I think that's really really exciting yeah massively so right Sophie I am going to uh, take a look in the uh, Q&A there's a few questions that <coughs> um, I will just mention to uh, the participants and to reiterate we apologise if anyone had any difficulties coming into the talk today. We've been made aware that there have been national technical uh, issues with getting through the event oh, right function. No. Um, so just to let you know that this talk uh, is and has been recorded and we will be sending that out um, to any of you that weren't able to either see it or have missed part of the beginning. So. We do apologise, nothing on our side. Uh, unfortunately, that was something to do with uh, Eventbrite. Anyway, uh, Sophie, I'm going to get into the Q&A uh, now. So um, first question for you, Sophie, what motivates you more than anything to communicate the importance of understanding nature and how we interact with it? Oh, wow. That's such a nice question. Um, crikey. Uh, gosh, many things, I think. Um, I think, obviously, very recently, as in the last week or so, it's just been the coming to terms of the urgency of the situation in terms of the climate and the climate crisis. Um, but I think mainly what motivates me most um, is people and I think people's stories and I think what you were saying Amy about collaboration and I think if there's ever an opportunity to I'm very lucky to work in conservation directly and just the effect that a simple conservation success story or a tiny win for for nature can have on the people around you and the buzz that that gives um, is so motivating because I think it's very easy to feel bogged down in all the all the gloomy statistics and, and, and everything. Um, but it's so easy for that to overshadow amazing work that's happening on the ground, you know, by the Wildlife Trust, by other NGOs and, and everything. And, you know, by everyday people I saw on Twitter a few minutes before I came on that um, someone's taxi driver in Glasgow felt impacted by everything going on and then had signed up to be a volunteer seagrass sower around Scotland. Um, and to find out more about it. And I just think mm -hmm. there's so much hope there. And so it's little stories like that from people who have um, taken just the tiniest thing away from a huge, great big uh, sort of monster like climate change and, and let that kind of digest and then, and then sort of influence a, a change in behavior or attitude. And I think that's what really motivates me because it shows it is so possible. We just have to keep, keep at it. Thanks. I'm actually going to um, 
ask Ben that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Just because um, Ben works with us at the Wildlife Trust, but he also has um, a second role um, within education. I'm working with mm. a lot of students. And I just wondered whether you had um, any answer to what motivates you to communicate the importance of nature in your job at all. Well, thanks, Amy, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Um, I think very much along the lines of what Sophie was saying it applies to me as well and I think it applies to all of us really in um, science communication and who work in kind of nature engagement work. I think um, it's about getting across our passion for mm. everything that's going on and our deeper understanding that not everyone has from their own experiences to understand the importance of stepping up and taking action and the sort of intrinsically interlinked nature, like Sophie mentioned at the end of the talk there, between nature and climate and also between all of it and ourselves. So I think really for me, it's about helping people understand what's going on and why, why it's important to them. And it's not just important mm. to us as people who are really into nature and we're, you know, the tree huggers of the world. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, okay, uh, another question for you, Sophie. How do you think we can influence uh, big landowners to restore and rewild more of their land? Hmm, that is a very good question. Um, I think uh, from recent experience, the main thing is to make them feel heard um, and to give them a, a seat at the table for all these conversations and um, Landowners, I think, often have recently felt victimised for being, you know, it's very easy for conservationists to say, oh, farming has ruined everything. Um, and yes, yeah, some statistics say that, but then, you know, lots of farmers are under the under the immense pressure and are kind of trapped in, in subsidies and payment schemes. And um, a good friend of mine once told me that we ask farmers to do one thing, but they're paid to do another. And so it's very difficult for farmers at the moment to make any choices for nature without having to going through going through immense like rigmarole and paperwork and um legislation and so i think that farmers feel frustrated a lot of farmers desperately want to farm for nature and understand how that will help um but often they feel that they're not being listened to or their concerns aren't there so i think the main thing is to is to have empathy really um and to start there and to build a relationship that is positive and mutual and um and then you know further conversations towards taking risks and and setting aside land for nature and maybe cultivating in favor of species like marsh fritillary um at low or no cost to their productivity as we saw in those successful projects um is totally possible but i think the main thing is um opening a dialogue that is honest and um non-accusatory accusatory how do you say it great thank you um a comment saying amazing presentation sophie which we all agree with oh, thank um, you. what do you think of the new environment bill and is it good news for the marsh fertility uh well you have put me on the spot because i haven't read through it properly yet as it only came out yesterday or was only le legalized yesterday but i think it is good news in many ways for nature because um a lot of it's in law which is what we really need it's to have that legal binding um in terms of marsh artillery i will have to look that one up and get back to you and maybe chat to clever caroline and rachel about that but if it talks about habitat i mean feel free to jump in here guys because you probably know a lot more than i do at this stage um if it's if it's basically anything that's in favor of habitat connectivity and facilitating nature corridors and nature networks is going to be good news for the marsh artillery so that's my poor okay. answer Thanks. um one i might defer to ben on this one are there any plans to restore the marsh artillery to surrey there's all the questionings about um, restoring and uh, rewilding, mm. but any plan? Um, not personally aware of any, but I think more broadly, we are attempting to restore a lot of nature that has been lost in the county. So um, we have some plans to work on particular species, like we're thinking about working on reintroduction of species like water vole at the moment. Um, 
we have previously worked on plans to restore populations of butterfly with um, butterfly conservation. We worked on the small blue blue project in the last couple of years across our chalk grasslands. So I think the marsh fertility is definitely not something we'd never say never to. And I'm sure if Good. the opportunity arises, <laughs> we'd be very keen. Um, but ho hopefully as um, kind of what along the lines of what Sophie was saying, if we do the work we're doing anyway to improve habitat, to improve connectivity between habitat and provide vital stepping stones for nature, in particular through urban areas, through things like green infrastructure and nature-based solutions, then if we build it, they will come. So hopefully they'll get back on their own. Definitely. And it's about that habitat scale improvement um, mm. rather than kind of reintroduction with a lot of these species and looking how that we, we can work together to do that. Um, OK, uh, is there any citizen mm. science work for the marsh fertility going on? Um, Sophie, I don't know if you um, can talk something about more nationally or in the areas you were speaking about and then perhaps Ben you could mention just generally about some of our citizen science perhaps. Yeah so um, all the more butterflies again butterfly conservation and the two moors threatened butterfly project both enlisted I don't think I think all the more butterflies are still ongoing but they both enlisted an incredible number of volunteers um, to help them with surveys and public engagement work and um, training for farmers and stuff. And, um, and so that was a really great way to, to um, reach out to the public to get them involved in practical conservation there. Um, and then also they have also, there's all sorts of communications um, kind of coming out to, that can you know, be shared. And to be citizen scientists, it's helping to improve the data set and improving data set can be anything from being practical surveyors um, out in the field or by sharing videos and communications and doing your own research and perhaps posting your own communications about these amazing species. So it takes many forms. It just depends what, what floats your boat. Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, a few citizen science programs going on that we run as a, as a wildlife trust. So we have um, a hedgerow heritage project, which some of you might have come across before, where we have our citizen science volunteers out and about surveying Surrey's hedges for us. We also partake in the Riverfly program. So we have citizen scientists out and about um, going into the rivers, doing riverfly surveys for us. So looking at things like um, mayfly larva and other aquatic larva of insects that um, are good, really good indicators of pollution. Um, those guys are also doing phosphate surveys, Himalayan balsam surveys. So we have a really great bunch of citizen science volunteers who are providing us with a huge amount of data. And like Sophie mentioned, that's really important for informing a lot of projects because much of the conservation sector is made up of NGOs who don't always have all the time they'd want to be able to do things like this. So we really value the contributions mm -hmm. that come from citizen science. And apart from just providing data for us, it's also a fantastic engagement tool for to get people out and about and doing things for nature that can often lead on to other things as well. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Ben. Um, a question here from Martin. Over the last 20 years, I have planted indigenous species to help the butterfly population in my garden. Recently, I have seen a lack of numbers and variety, which I'm sad about. How can the public help in their own gardens to encourage more to visit and feed and reproduce? Um, well, you're doing a great thing by planting native species. That is a very a key way to invite pollinators to your garden. I think um, just keep doing what you're doing. I think uh, try to plant things that have um, Try to ensure that your garden has flowers sort of all year round. So plant. I'm not very clued up on on gardening, but um, a few people have told me that you can you can buy plants that flower at different times of the year. So there's just always an option for pollinators. So there are pollinators that persist throughout the year, and so they still need some some food and uh, some resources there. And so basically, to, it's all about that variety and that resilience. And, and not a monoculture, so having um, lots of different options for different species there. Um, and it doesn't matter where you live, how small your garden is, whether you have a garden or not, there's always something that you can do for insects and insects are so in, in such desperate need of our help. And 
if we can even just you know plant in a in an old yogurt pot you know just a couple of wild flowers and things like that just as, as simple as you like but everything does really help I think just spread the word as well um you know if a neighbor is doing a garden redesign or is mowing their lawn you know maybe just ask them in a, in a friendly way um why are you mowing your lawn <laughs> please don't <laughs> But anyway, I think what you're doing is great. I think it's just all about everybody doing a little bit of that. And that's when you really see the impact. But um, again, Ben, please feel free to flesh out what I've just said. No, I, I think you you put it brilliantly. Uh, just encourage everyone to check out the Wildlife Trust Action for Insects campaign. Mm. Um, as Sophie was saying, you know, we're, we're possibly on track to lose about 41% of our insects across the country. Um, so it really is important to do all those little things like planting seeds in yogurt pots um, to try and stop that loss and decline. They've got some really great diagrams as well on the Wildlife Trust on your website in terms of what to do in your garden. And it's so easy. You can just do it on a, in an afternoon. Um, but there are loads of different, loads of different kinds of things. There is, um, and in fact, if um, anyone wants to, if you look on our website, um, we also have a wildlife gardening survey, which is a, a great tool to, you go through and kind of check off the features of your garden and can give you a score and some advice and uh, hints and tips if you want to sign up for the email there about how you can improve and increase that score over time. And I think what it's important to do, um, as you mentioned, Sophie, actually the point of talking to your neighbours or people on your street is a really good one because if you think about stepping stones in the landscape, um, especially for pollinators, um, you know, we need multiple stepping stones in the landscape. And if you're thinking about mm. you're taking action in your one garden, think about what could happen if you influ influence what your neighbours perhaps do on your street. And then that becomes a whole super highway for pollinators, uh, which is really important. And in fact, in Surrey, we have over 20,000 hectares of gardens. Um, and if you think about if all of those joined up together to be uh, wildlife friendly or pollinator friendly, that could make a huge difference for species, you know, such as butterfly species, to be able to move across quite a fragmented, fragmented uh, landscape, especially in urban areas. Um, so uh, uh, Nick's question about what's the best thing we can do in our back gardens for wildlife, that would be my answer actually is join it up with other places, let wildlife mm. move uh, and Such create more of a super highway. But I don't know if mm. you guys had anything else to add to what's the best thing we can do in our back gardens for wildlife. I think just that is such a good one because uh, we like to have little little boxes of our garden next door's garden all sealed off and neat and lovely but I think that and just taking a step back from it you know maybe just put a little less effort into your garden and um, not letting it go to total abandon you don't have to do that but again a bit like with the marsh artillery stuff um, a balance between you know a light touch um, and just letting nature have a little bit more of a say in what's going on in your garden and uh, you know wildlife will love a little bit of scrappy habitat but yeah I think that joining up with your neighborhood is is brilliant and you know that's great for for mammals and birds and insects and everything yeah just echoing what you two have said <laughs> and kind of answering one of Martin's questions as well in there about creating corridors across the landscape for wildlife that, that's what it's all about Amy said you know we've got 20,000 hectares of gardens in Surrey. They make up a huge proportion of our land cover here. Some mm. of, one of the biggest landowners in the county is residents. It's, you know, not the county council, not golf courses, residents. So we really need to be working with people to help improve the connectivity that can be provided by their gardens. One of the projects we're working on at the moment is about trying to establish where are the best corridors through Surrey's main urban centres like mm. Woking and Guildford. And gardens are going to play a huge role in that. And we need to work out how, how can things move from one side of Woking to the other side of Woking and then how can we work with the local councils to improve those routes as well. Great thank you. Okay coming to the last couple of questions um, if you do have any more questions for Sophie please do put them uh, in the Q&A um, otherwise we're coming to our last couple. Um, Sophie is the plight of the marsh fritillary worse than other fritillaries or is it a theme across all of them? 
Um, I can't say for sure without looking into it, whether it's worse. It's definitely probably, I mean, it is pretty bad. It is one of the rarest butterflies in the UK and you saw how protected it is in terms of um, the legislation behind it. And it's only got that because of how near to extinction it really is. But as you saw in the um, data that I pulled up of the last sightings of the marsh retinary in Surrey, uh, the majority of the species that were last sighted and were have been lost from Surrey are fritillaries. And so I really do think that as a, as a family of butterflies, they are very, very threatened. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I don't know if it's because their life cycles are particularly complicated or innate or that there's um, those kind of host parasite interactions. I have to do a bit more digging into it. But certainly the fritillaries, if you see one, it is very special because um, they're not they're not very common and it's such a shame they're just they're so stunning um and they're so interesting and so um if a if a county has got populations of fritillaries it's really interesting to sort of dig into what are they doing with their land and figuring out okay how how does it differ to what we're doing and could we be doing that as well great thank you um, and uh, second to last question, are there any opportunities for rewilding in Norbury Park or Sheepleys? Um, I'll just jump in on this one. These are two sites, um, uh, part of the Surrey County Council estate. So we just uh, manage parts of that land for conservation. So unfortunately we don't have control of that in terms of those sites. Um, I think generally there's quite a debate about rewilding and what people um, mean by that. There's a, there's a huge um, variety of kind of explanations of, of, of what that can be. And um, I think a lot of us like to think that it's about restoring natural processes. And if we start thinking about it in that way, um, sometimes it's a bit less scary for people if you're talking about restoring natural processes on the land rather than uh, rewilding huge areas, which brings up um, visions of uh, wolves and, and, and all sorts of <laughs> potential things uh, that could go on. Uh, ben, I don't know if you had anything else to say about uh, rewilding or uh, restoring natural processes. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a rabbit hole, isn't it, to go down that one <laughs> that we probably don't have time for now. But um, I think, like Amy said, it is about restoring natural processes, um, but also appreciating that the landscape is so drastically altered from what it was a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, that what what worked then is not necessarily going to be completely replicable today. You know, because we we do unfortunately exist, and we need houses and towns and schools and things like that, and we do take up quite a lot of the land space on on the planet really and that's probably why it's in so much trouble but rewilding i think as an approach has huge benefits it's a great kind of um motion in the conservation industry to get people thinking about um really restoring things back 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 way long back to its roots but also we when we when we're actually applying it in conservation management we need to think more carefully about how exactly it's going to work because some animals such as the large herbivores that would have grazed in England don't exist anymore so if we just rewild and leave it they're not there to regulate the way they should do so do we then need to make conservation interventions to replicate the the actions they would take it's, it's a rabbit hole but one one that there I don't think there is a very black and white answer to it's very gray gray space Great, thanks. Um, a comment uh, in the chat I will pick up. Um, uh, Anna mentioned about uh, a good shout out to uh, one of our uh, known farmers, Hugh Broom, uh, at Westcott doing fantastic work to assist nature, um, commenting how um, they've had some great days there doing mammal trapping and volunteers days and, and hedgerow laying. I don't know if you had anything else to comment on that then. Yeah, he is doing fantastic work as part of the North Downs farm cluster and linking back to what Sophie was talking about earlier about just working with landowners and being sympathetic to what they have to say. A really important piece of legislation at the moment is the ELMS scheme, which is the new environmental land management scheme, which is going to replace all of the subsidies that farmers got from the European legislation. And um, 
you know, it's something that we need to take this opportunity to work with farmers and make sure that the subsidies work for them, but also work for nature. Because as Sophie was saying, uh, what was it that you said that they're being paid to do? Ask, we're asking farmers to do one thing, but paying them to do another. Yeah, exactly. Not my words. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. So we need to take the opportunity with the new ELM scheme to pay them for what we're telling them to do. Yeah. And it's work just having with that them. consistency, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we did a project recently with a student from Imperial who did a kind of stakeholder opinion with um, with probably Hugh Broom and lots of the other Surrey landowners. And it came back that they are overwhelmingly in favour of working for nature and implementing conservation in their in their practice. But it's just mm -hmm. about removing all the red tape, making it mm -hmm. less scary and bureaucratic and making it more accessible for them. Sorry, had some issues with the unmute button there. Um, thank you, Ben. Yeah, um, a very interesting topic. A um, couple more just popped up. So I'd probably take these uh, last two. Um, I don't use any pesticides because of how indiscriminate they are and what they kill. How can we get over to farmers and the public the dangers of misuse? Sophie, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, really good question. Pesticides are, the UK is unfortunately pretty showered with pesticides um, and there's been a lot of flip-flopping in rhetoric from the government about uh, pesticides. However, I think in terms of how can we communicate their misuse and everything, it's just good communication and I think stating the facts and I think making the most of um, resources provided by the wildlife trusts and other organizations to really kind of get clued up on what's right and what's wrong in terms of what is fact and what's opinion etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, just doing whatever works for you in terms of shouting about it whether that's in an extroverted way or whether that's in an introverted way in sort of polite conversation I don't know but I think um, the more people that that you know talk about it and and call us out then you know the more likely that those who are in charge will will listen and, and make good decisions so it's just a classic you know people power lobbying that sort of thing but um just stating the facts and the you know um dave goulson professor dave goulson is an incredible uh fountain of knowledge and expertise on uh, pesticides and the dangers they pose to to nature, countryside, food, everything. So I'd really um, recommend following him and his columns because he does it in a very um, easy to understand, digestible way, but it still gets across the severity of the situation. So um, I think try and stick away from them, stay away from them yourself and try and spread the word. Yeah, definitely. Just to drop a little fact <laughs> on the end of that um the something that's always stuck with me since i read about it was that there was an incident i think um 2010 or something like that on the river kennet where someone put two teaspoons of commercially available ant poison i think it was into the river and it killed nearly all invertebrate life in a 30 kilometer stretch Ooh. so it really shows you the yeah. power how bad pesticides can be mm. Yeah, and it's something that's very topical, and I think um, it's something that landowners and um, organisations and even local authorities are really delving into. And I would definitely recommend checking out um, Pesticide Action Network UK. They are mm. uh, one of the only charities focused solely on tackling um, pesticide issues, um, and they've got some... Um, great uh, resources and information so I definitely um, recommend checking those out and we have been looking to work with them to um, bring together some information. Um, okay, uh, are regenerative approaches economically viable for farmers with regard to the schemes available or does there need to be more to push for more of this to promote regenerative rewilding farming? Now we've kind of mentioned a little bit about that with the elms, I don't know if there's anything else either of you wanted to um, mention about um, regenerative approaches being mm. economically viable? I can't speak too much for it as I'm not a, a farmer myself but the farmers that we work with at, at Beaver Trust and who I know just sort of around um, are 
hopeful and encouraged by what is being presented in Elms and we're going to see more development of what that's really going to mean for farmers and landowners probably early on next year so I think a lot of farmers are kind of waiting with interest because what they've seen so far seems quite promising in terms of being rewarded financially for making decisions for nature that's not a massive cost to their productivity but um you know, I think personal opinion, I think, you know, we can't support farmers enough. We need farmers, we need food, we have so many people. And so I think when it's someone's livelihood and business at stake, and we're asking them to, to set aside margins of land as buffer strips and nature corridors and all these things, um, we, we need them to be supported. So if there are, the, the more schemes there are that do that and are fair, um, the better. Yep, definitely. As as Sophie said, we've got to just work with them, not against them. Uh, that that's the way to do it. They're massive landowners in parts of the UK. You know, probably in the UK overall, they're a massive landowner as well. So they have a big stake in what goes on on the ground. So we need to get them on side and try and rectify. I think what's been a very historic barrier mm -hmm. between sort of ecologists and scientists and then farmers and landowners and there's there's always been a bit of tension barrier and I think mm. Elms is a good clean slate to try and address that and start being friends. Well said. <laughs> Definitely and we have some great relationships with a lot of landowners across Surrey and working with them and within the farm cluster groups and uh, as I kind of said at the beginning collaboration is key you know we can't do this on our own and specifically as a Surrey Wildlife Trust, we have influence in terms of managing just under 5% of the land in Surrey, but that leaves 95% that we need to advise and influence and empower other people to take action appropriately to, to connect these wildlife corridors and uh, create stepping stones in the landscape so that species can adapt, species can survive mm -hmm. and wildlife can um, you know, thrive despite the the um, issues that may come from uh, climate change and, and, and any other land pressures. Well, um, that's all of the questions tonight. We're so uh, grateful for all of you that came on and listened. And again, sorry about the technical issues um, in the beginning. We will be sending out a follow-up email with some uh, references to what we've spoken about, including um, the link to the recording. So please do share that far and wide. We have all sorts of fantastic recordings of talks on our YouTube channel. So please do find us, Surrey Wildlife Trust, on YouTube if you'd like to check those out uh, and follow us on social media to keep up with uh, what's going on at the moment. Um, lastly, there was one question in the chat, Sophie, that asked, um, uh, when will your book be out? And I thought we could uh, end on oh, that one. Um, it's coming out on the 9th of June next year. All, all being well. <laughs> Brilliant. So we will keep our eye out for that. I'm sure we will be sending Gee. information around to promote that as well. So yes. um, good luck with that, Sophie. Um, and thank, thank you, you very much to Sophie for your talk today and for Ben for being on the panel. Um, and thank you all Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone.